I said, I can do that. And my mind would say, as I would go to my car, how, Les Brown? You don't have a college education. How, Les Brown? You were labeled educable, mentally retarded. You failed twice in school, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade. You have no college training. You never worked for a major corporation. How would you do that? And people would say to me, Les, you have the gift of gab. Les, you have personality. Les, you are funny. People like you. And I was running from that. For 14 years, I did not allow this Les Brown that you now see exists. For 14 years, I procrastinated. How many of you thought about something you wanted to do and you stopped you from doing it? Raise your hands, please. There's an African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. It's me, oh me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. prayer. I knew about Elijah because I was hiding out. I don't have a college education. I felt inferior to people who had college educations. I allowed that to silence me. I was intimidated. I felt like a failure. I felt like I wasn't good enough. Oh, I understood. Hiding in a cave, putting yourself down, being ashamed of the mistakes that you've made. Don't want to face people. The other church met a woman that I looked at and, and said this woman's going to be my wife and married her and then God asked me as I sat across and looked at her with an attorney in each one of our sides what are you doing here you're less brown you teach people how to live their dreams you teach people how to be successful what are you doing here going through a divorce how can you stand up and speak to people about how to live their dreams, how to build successful families, and you couldn't make your marriage work. You waited 16 years to get married, and you did it, and you failed. And I went in a cave. For a long time, I would not come out and speak. When I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and I was given a two to three year prognosis, I went in a cave. I was embarrassed to come out. I was overhearing a conversation when I was coming in and a lady didn't know I was standing behind her. And she said, she probably divorced him because now he's going to be half a man. He had prostate cancer. And I went back home and my son said, come on, Dad. This is not you not speaking. This is not you, this bubbly personality that I know. Are you going to die? John, let's be, all of us will die one day. But are you going to die from cancer? Are you going to fight? Yes. Are you afraid? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid. We'll feel the fear and fight anyhow. Come on, Dad. Come out. Open the shades. Come out this room. You're my dad. You're strong. Come on, Dad. My son, out of the mouths of pains, my son became my mother. I know when you've had blessings in your life, Elijah, he was God's man. He laid on a little boy that was dead and, and God brought him back to life. He spoke and, and he said, I feel an abundance of rain coming. It was a drought and it rained. He was a bad man. God put his hands on his shoulder. He didn't say that God's spirit was on him. He said his hand was on his shoulder. Come here, elder. Put your hand on my shoulder. Wherever I go, you come, all right? His hand was on his shoulder, all right? Come on, Elder, come on, all right? His hand was on his shoulder now. So what happened was, see, you come up in here, thank you so much. If you come up in here and make the statement that, that the day that God ran from his enemy, you better be theologically sound. So it said his hand was on his shoulder, and when the word went out that she was going to kill him, he ran. He ran. He ran, and, 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 and listen, and God sent angels to feed him, to wake him up, to give him substance for the journey. And, and many of us, when you get X number of hits, it, life can take so much out of you. My mother was dying of breast cancer. I was going through a divorce, and then I was diagnosed with prostate can cancer. I was out of my mind. I wasn't myself. That's, how many of you know that life can catch you on the blind side, can hit you so many times, you can't think straight.
How many know what I'm talking about? That you can't even pray. You need somebody to pray for you and lay hands on you. I remember listening to the radio. In ordinary life, I'd change the channel. And I hear stuff like this. If you are suffering from any kind of incurable disease, please call this number right now and order your miracle prayer cloth. I was about to change the channel. And the lady said, I had whiplash. And I bought the prayer cloth and I was healed in the name of Jesus. I said, listen to this foolishness. I'm about to hit the channel. The guy said, I had prostate cancer. I said, wait a minute. My PSA was 2,000, and I got that prayer cloth. I went at home, and, and I put it on my body, and I was healed in the name of Jesus. This prayer cloth, only $3. I sent the man $100 and said, send me a prayer blanket. <laughs> Here I am in church saying, we are more than conquerors. Judge not according to appearances. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And the man looked at me and said, you have cancer and I'm buying prayer cloths. And when it came, they had a lot of little prayer cloths all cut up. And they said, put them in the, they gave you instructions, put it in the affected area. So I stuffed them in my underwear. God is my witness. I'm on stage giving a speech in Detroit. And I'm walking back and said, you've got to be hungry when you're working on your dream. You've got to be unstoppable. You've got to go after your stuff. And people were laughing and looking behind me. And I looked back in the prayer closet, pegged by my pants. I started picking them up. I said, you can laugh if you want to. I'm going to get these prayer clothes. I'm going to get, I don't care nothing about y'all laughing. I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Now I'm cancer free, I'm debt free, and drama free. I don't care nothing about y'all laughing. I got one on now. I was running scared. I was running scared. I was going to all kind of healers. Some, I'm not the only one that did this up in here. I was praying to Jesus, Yahweh, Nomi Yoho, Renge Kio. I was chanting. I was calling everybody. You hear me? The whole game. Remember going to Detroit and went to this healer. They said this lady had healing hands. I went there and people coming in, a friend of mine named Rudy, he came in on the cane. And I knew he was an accident, had pinched nerve. And he was one of the people she pulled out of the audience. And she brought Rudy up there, he came up there with his cane. She said, give me this cane, took his cane. Told the guy to broke it. I said, whoa. She said, what's wrong with you? He said, I got a pinched nerve. She said, where? My back here, I was in an accident. My back, you've been right for five years. She said, touch your toes. He said, oh, I can't do that. I, I'm in too much pain. She said, I said, touch your toes, name of Jesus. He went down, wham. I said, whoa, I got up and got in line. By the time I got up there, she said, okay, these hands are anointed by God. She said, I, I don't do no healing, but God just works through me. She said, what's your problem? I said, I got cancer. I said, but just touch me on the head. It'll go through my whole body. Just <laughs> touch me right now and it'll go through my head. She said, do you believe in God? I said, yes, ma'am. I want direct contact. What is your problem? Where do you, where's your cancer? I said, if you touch me on the head, it will go all through my body, I, I promise you. She said, where, boy, is the cancer? I said, I got prostate cancer. She said, touch him, Jesus. Touch him, touch him. <laughs> I was running everywhere trying to get some help. And the angel had to wake him up twice how many of you know that when you are under attack when you are stressed out you can't sleep well raise your hands please and God gave him food for the journey that when you're going through your stuff understand you're not by yourself and he asked the question what are you doing here he didn't ask what are you doing in there he said what are you doing here why are you running 
You're making me look bad. I got your back. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm with you. If you make your bed in hell, I'm with you. If you ascend up to heaven, I'm with you. Wherever thou goest, I will be there. What are you doing here? One night I'm looking at television. I see these young guys on television using all kind of profanity. Young ladies not dressed appropriately. They're doing drugs. And I was looking down them at my nose saying, look at this exploitation. This is horrible. This is demeaning. This is degrading. And as I sat there in the dark in my footaloom underwear, God asked, what are you doing here? On the couch, talking about them. There's never been a statue erected to a critic. What are you doing here? Talking about them. I gave you Mamie Brown. I took you out of your biological mother's womb and placed you in the heart of your adopted mother. I saved you from prostate cancer. 14 years ago, they gave you two to three years. Here it is now, 14 years later, your PSA, which stands for prostate-specific antigen, is over 400 and you're cancer-free. You are debt-free. You are drama-free. I gave you the gift of word to inspire. Here you are sitting in the dark looking at these young boys and they got somebody to buy into their dream. They got somebody to invest in their script. They got a cast. They got a crew. They got cameras. They got studios. They got it in theaters. They got it on television. You should be on television and they should be on a couch watching you. What are you doing here? See, the difference between the world today, ladies and gentlemen, is that the bad people are outworking the good people. It's never been a statue erected to a critic. They work hard. Let us say together, it's my time. Said now, it's my time.